video today is going to be a high level overview of the south rim of the grand canyon i've crammed a full day's worth of driving around into about 30 minutes here you can do the same if you'd like but if you want to have a better experience i would suggest to allow yourself a couple days if you're the kind of person that likes to dive deep into all aspects of the park you're going to need more time than that if you plan on doing extended walking or hiking around make sure you allow additional time for that as well as you arrive at the entrance station, pay attention to the overhead arrows indicating which lanes are open. Several times coming into the park, I observed multiple vehicles queued up at a couple fee booths when there were additional lanes open. The leftmost lane is an express reentry lane for those with valid passes or existing paid admissions. Oftentimes, I observe nobody in that lane. Grand Canyon National Park charges an entrance fee. Passenger vehicles up to 15 passengers is $35, motorcycle for 30 or an individual whether they're walking, biking, rafting through the canyon, or riding by shell bus is $20 each. Your America the Beautiful Interagency Pass, of course, will get you in as well. Those are $80 annually. Senior passes are $80 for lifetime or $20 annually. There are free annual passes available for military personnel. Free lifetime passes available for veterans and Gold Star families. Access passes are lifetime and free for handicapped individuals. Once you come into the park from the south entrance station, the first opportunity to turn that you will have will be a left turn onto Center Road. That will take you over to the two developed campgrounds here on the west side of Grand Canyon National Park. Mather Campground, which is a no-hookup campground, has 327 sites, currently $18 a piece, can be reserved on recreation.gov. Trailer Village RV Park is full hookup. It has sort of variable rate structure that I can't seem to decipher, but it's around $60 to $80. It is not available on recreation.gov. It is managed separately and is reservable through visitgrandcanyon.com. Neither one of the locations have showers, but there are showers and laundry available at camper services near the campgrounds there. Showers are $2.50 for five minutes. There is one other developed campground here on the South Rim, Desert View, at the east entrance. It is in no hookups and it's currently $18 per night. They have 50 sites reservable on recreation.gov. They have water and toilets down there, but no showers at all, and it's only operated seasonally from May to mid-October. If you're headed east on Desert View Drive from the South Entrance Road, the first thing you'll come across will be Pipe Creek Vista, a popular parking spot especially for people headed out to Yaki Point or South Kaibab Trailhead. You cannot drive out to Yaki Point or South Kaibab Trailhead. You can park at the road and walk, or you can take the orange route, the Kaibab Route shuttle bus from the Visitor Center. Continuing on east, the first scenic viewpoint that you can drive out to is Grandview Point. Up next will be Moran Point. If you've never been on the east side of the park here on the south rim, it is a lot more sparse than the west side towards the village. I'm cutting out a lot of footage of me just driving here. A lot of the east side of the park is just driving through this pine area. And as you can see from the amount of the snow on the ground, can be a little chilly in February. The next view will be Lippin Point. I really enjoyed this one just for the way it kind of rises up a hill and juts out into the canyon.
final stop headed east towards Desert View will be Navajo Point. Truthfully, it's not one of my favorite stops on the route, but it does offer an interesting vantage point of Desert View Tower from a distance. We're here at Desert View Watchtower at the east entrance of Grand Canyon National Park. This is about 28 miles from Tucson. It's about 33 miles on to Cameroon. There's a gas station here, a little market deli, a general store or souvenir store I guess, probably more like it. There's a campground here as well. Some of this out here is seasonally operated. It is currently mid-February here so I'm not sure what all is open typically you can go up in the watchtower I think it may be closed right now I'm pretty sure that it is actually closed right now you might be able to go into the souvenir shop here there's also a bigger shop over there the trading post but in the base of the watchtower there's a little souvenir shop ran by the Grand Canyon Conservancy yeah okay so sign right here says tower closed Ground floor retail store open. Desert View Tower was built in 1932 here at the east entrance of the Grand Canyon National Park. In 1956 at the site, or near the site, a United Airlines flight hit a TWA flight midair. There's a memorial plaque over there for that as well. Having finished up my tour of the east side of the park, I'm headed back west to 23 miles or approximately 37 kilometers back to Mather Point Overlook at the Visitor Center. I made all my stops headed from west to east, but if there's a lot of traffic, it makes more sense to start at Desert View and then work your way back west so you're not turning across traffic every time. So we're here on the west side of the park. One of the first places you'll come to when you head to the west side is the Visitor Center and Mather Point. Despite it being a very busy overlook, it is a really nice overlook, so you shouldn't pass it up. next segment of the video covers a lot of the buildings and attractions by the rim at the village, so we're going to hop off and take a walk around. It's a worthwhile stop, but if you don't want to do it, be sure to see my chapters and jump past it. The best way to explore this area is to take a stroll along the rim walk. You could walk that from the visitor center if you like, but otherwise you might be able to find a parking spot near the Altavar or Bright Angel Lodge. The place to start up here is near Verkamp Store, which operated by the Verkamp family from 1906 to 2008. 
when they decided not to renew their concessionaire license and it was purchased by the Park Service and now currently operated by the Grand Canyon Conservancy. Onward from that is the Hopi House, which was built in 1904 and opened in 1905, one of eight buildings on the Grand Canyon designed by Mary Coulter. It was built for the Fred Harvey Company as a place to sell goods. Right next to that is the El Tavar Hotel, which was originally a Harvey House Hotel, built for the Santa Fe Railroad in 1905. It was designated as a historic landmark in 1987. When the El Tavar was designed, not all the rooms had private bathrooms. They do now, currently about 78 guest rooms, some of which are suites. I'm not sure that it's worthwhile to try to quote accommodation prices here on the video as it, they will date. and seems like hotel prices are more susceptible to fluctuations depending on season and demand, but you can check out GrandCanyonLodges.com to find hotel pricing. I can tell you if you're going to want to stay in the park, you're going to need to plan for reservations significantly in advance. At a quick glance, I was having difficulty finding rooms available just to even find a price idea, but Massac Lodge, for example, during the summer I found around $260 or so. Per night that's not on the rim that's not even in this video and then the El Tavar here like 370 plus depending on the room just down from the El Tavar is the Kachina and Thunderbird Lodges as you can tell from the style of those they were built in the 60s there are more reasonably priced accommodations I guess you'd say if you want to stay on the rim but not pay the higher prices of the upscale hotels for those two hotels, you'll check in at the Bright Angel, which is located just next door. Bright Angel Lodge is another building designed by Mary Coulter. It was built here in 1935. Now integrated into the Bright Angel Lodge accommodations are the old cabins next to it. Here you have the Bucky O'Neill cabin built in the 1890s. Just down from that, you'll see another Mary Coulter project here, the Lookout Studio, built in 1914 for the Santa Fe Railroad. It was built to compete with the neighboring Cole Brothers Studio just down the way here. The Lookout Studio is now operated by the Grand Canyon Conservancy. It offers a couple neat views overlooking the Grand Canyon. There's a balcony and a terrace. Those can sometimes be closed due to inclement weather conditions, but if not, be sure to go through the store and take a look at those. happens to be closed or it isn't your thing be sure to head up and check out the balcony instead it does have fairly limited space but it does offer excellent views of the canyon Brothers Ellsworth and Emery Kolb came to the Grand Canyon in the early 1900s and opened the Kolb Studio in 1904 and operated it until 1976. It was built on a mining claim owned by Ralph Cameron, the guy who managed to get control of the Bright Angel Trail. After the Park Service purchased the Kolb Studio in 1976, it was renovated and is now operated as a souvenir shop by the Grand Canyon Conservancy. It also houses a nice little museum in the lower section featuring the Kolb Brothers and their photography work. Part of the Kolb Brothers business was photographing mule riders in the canyon, then offering prints for sale. 
If you're interested in learning more about the Cole brothers and their work here at the Grand Canyon, I would encourage you to visit the exhibit. I don't have time to cover it in detail today, but it is a very nice display. I thought this projector was an interesting piece. It is actually original to the Cole Brothers studio and at one time was removed and put into storage and forgot about. It was recently rediscovered and brought back to the studio as a museum piece. Right next to Kolb Studios is the Bright Angel Trailhead, which runs 8 miles or 13 kilometers down to the Colorado River for a 4,380 foot or 1,340 meter elevation change. The trail does continue a couple additional miles onto Phantom Ranch. The trail was originally developed by the Havasupai people down to what is now known as Indian Gardens for access to the spring water. Ralph Cameron later obtained control of the trail when the Havasupai people were essentially evicted by the development of the park. He charged a $1 toll and additional fees to utilize the spring water and outhouses at Indian Gardens. He also was responsible for extending the trail onto the river. After a lengthy battle, the Park Service was able to obtain control of the trail in 1928. Ralph Cameron had a mining claim here. That's how the Cole brothers managed to build their studio and why it was right next to the start of the Bright Angel Trail. Continuing west from the hotels here at the rim, we'll be passing the Grand Canyon Depot. The train runs from Williams up to the Grand Canyon daily. Tickets range from $67 for a basic Pullman class ticket to $160 for a first class ticket, clear up to $226 for luxury dome or parlor tickets round trip. Probably one of my favorite things about visiting the Grand Canyon in the winter, aside from lighter crowds, is the ability to drive your vehicle out on Hermit Road. From the beginning of March to the end of November, the only way to access Hermit Road is to use the shuttle bus system or to walk via the room trail or ride a bicycle. During that time, the only way to drive to Hermit's Rest is if you have a backcountry permit for Boucher or Hermit Trail. During the months of December, January, and February, anyone is allowed to drive on Hermit's Road, and in fact, there is no shuttle service at that time. Hermit's Rest is a 7-mile or 11-kilometer road with 9 scenic pullouts. If you are riding the shuttle bus out to Hermit's Rest, the red route is a 14-mile loop to the transfer station and back, and that will take approximately 80 minutes without getting on or off the shuttle bus. So right off the bat here on Hermit Road, there's like three stops that I just kind of blew through there. I was going to cut those from the video, but I decided to go ahead and leave them in just to reinforce the fact that you can't really see all this thoroughly in one day. I pulled over at Trailview Overlook, but didn't really get off, and then I went past another overlook that didn't have a name, and then finally I drove on by Powell Memorial.
point, the last good viewpoint on the road. The final stop on the road is Hermit's Rest, which is the turnaround, the end of the road. You can see there, but it's not as good a viewpoint as this. There's a little store there, a gift store, and they have some snacks as well there, and some hiking trails that start from there. We've made it to Hermit's Rest. This is the end of the road, the turnaround point for us here. Hermit's Rest Road is only accessible by private vehicle for the month of December, January, and February. Hermit's Rest is another structure designed by Murray Coulter for the Fred Harvey Company. It was built in 1914 at the western terminus of the road here on the south rim. It serves tourists as a rest stop. The Grand Canyon Conservancy has a small souvenir shop as well as a snack shop in the building. It was designated as a historic landmark in 1987. It is also the start of the Nine Mile Hermit Trail which leads down to the Colorado River. Hermit Trail is probably considered one of the more extreme routes to the river as it is not maintained by the Park Service. The location was named for Canadian-born prospector Louis Boucher who had mining claims in below what we know today as Hermit's Rest. Boucher developed the trail down to Dripping Springs where he lived alone for many years. This is pretty well going to conclude the tour of the South Rim of the Grand Canyon for me. The video will continue with some clips of me riding out of the park, as well as I'm going to add some bonus footage of me visiting the Grandview Fire Tower on another day. The Grandview Fire Tower is on the east side of the park and back south on a forest service road. I do not recommend it when it's muddy. As we wrap up this look at the South Rim of the Grand Canyon National Park, I just wanted to mention a few of my favorite things of the visit, as well as give you a few tips to help you enjoy your trip a little more. One of the things that will help your trip go smoothly is if you purchase an entrance pass in advance. Those can be purchased through recreation.gov for a regular entrance for the park, as well as if you have an America the Beautiful pass, if you're visiting more than a couple parks, that will likely pay for itself. When you come into the park, if you already have a paid admission, you can use the left express entrance lane or any lane that's open. Be sure to look at those green arrows overhead to see which lanes are available. It's best to try to enter the park first thing in the morning. If you try to enter the park midday on a weekend, you're really going to regret your decision. If you're wanting to stay within the park, be sure to make reservations significantly in advance. If you're wanting to backpack in the park, you'll need a backcountry permit. Those go very quickly as well. You'll have to fill out a form and fax that to the backcountry office. As far as day hikes into the canyon go, of course, I can't recommend trying to hike to the river and back in a day, and the park service doesn't either, especially during the hot season. It's not advisable. But if you're looking to do a day hike part of the way into the canyon, Plateau Point is a nice hike if you're up for it. It's certainly not an easy hike at 13.3 miles or 21.5 kilometers round trip with 3,400 feet of elevation change or 1,036 meters. It utilizes the Bright Angel Trail, goes down to Indian Gardens Campground, and then continues out across the flat plateau. You can get water at Indian Gardens year-round, and seasonally there's water available at the 1.5 and the 3-mile rest house on Bright Angel Trail. However, those locations are shut off in the winter, so only available water at that time will be at Indian Gardens. If you're wanting to take the iconic mule ride into the canyon and stay down at Phantom Ranch, don't think that's just something you'll be able to show up and do. You'll need to make reservations significantly in advance. There's actually a lottery system for that as well. You can visit GrandCanyonLodges.com to try to figure out more about that. 
Currently, a mule ride into the canyon with a one-night stay at Phantom Ranch is a little over $700 per person, or about $1,200 per couple. As far as favorites of the trip go, it's really hard to narrow that down because there's so many beautiful spots, but on the east side, on Desert View Drive, I would have to say Lipen Point's probably my favorite overlook. In addition to that, of course, Desert View Tower is pretty much a mandatory stop for everyone as it is a great overlook as well as the interesting nature of the tower itself. Back towards the west side of the park, Mather Point is a very popular stop, partially because it's the visitor center, but it is also a really nice overlook, so that's worth checking out. Once you head down towards the village, I think the Lookout Studio is probably my favorite stop there because of the architecture and the views from it. The Kolb Studio is interesting as well for the museum section. Out on Hermit Road, there's a number of good stops. It's hard to pick there, but... I think Maricopa Point was one of my favorite areas just because it requires a short walk from the parking area, so it seemed to be a lot less busy than some of the other spots. As far as views go, I think Hopi Point out there is probably my top, I guess. Pima Point's also a cool stop. Of course, you need to swing by Hermit's Rest when you get to the end of the road. It's such an interesting building the way it was designed and built. That wraps up my thoughts here on the Grand Canyon. If you want to stick around for an additional minute, there is footage of me talking about the fire tower. So we've made it here to the Grand View Lookout Tower, just a little bit off the main road. The gravel road, the gravel road that the Forest Service says is suitable for passenger cars and maintained. I'm sure it is in good weather. Right now it's pretty muddy, as you can see from the video. Uh, but we have made it, no problems. Uh, I brought my Jeep. Uh, I didn't do this on my bike. I didn't even think about it then, and I'm probably glad I didn't. But um, here we are, it's 80 feet tall. It was built in 1936 by the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And it is a lookout tower for fires. There's also a two room cabin over there. Walk over and check that out in a minute. There's also a shitter here if you need to take a poo. But it's a nice one. Shall we review it? The poo review. Hey, there's actually toilet paper. And it looks kind of like a mess. No surprise there. Let's go over and check out the cabin. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for sticking around. If you did, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. If you have any comments, leave them in the comment section below. Be sure to subscribe so you can get notified about the latest adventure videos.